just played for you Bach Sinfonia number 15 in B minor. The Sinfonias are also known as the three-part inventions and Bach wrote 15 two-part and 15 three-part inventions in this epic cycle of 30. Of all of them this is the only one that has a time signature of 916 time. And in Bach's day, in the 18th century, musicians had a different understanding of what this large denominator of 16 meant than we do today. In their time, it meant that the piece was to be played light and lively. So it's a character and tempo indication. It's also, this piece, a toccata piece or a touch piece which is virtuoso and filled with 32nd note arpeggio-like passages played simultaneously with both hands. This is a, really a tour de force, and what Bach has created is an extraordinary blend of chordal combinations with these overlapping passages that creates a kaleidoscope of colors and harmonies. It's really a one-of-a-kind of all of the 30. So in the key of B minor, and let's just review what the tonality of B minor sounds like. Here's your chord. And built on B, which is the tonic, the median, D, dominant F sharp, scale in natural minor, with the two sharps of C sharp and F sharp. We also frequently find in the minors the use of the harmonic minor key, which raises the seventh step. So we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that A becomes A sharp. If I take the opening material, you're going to hear that A-sharp right away in measure two. Now this is a very interesting piece because in the first three measures, Bach has given us all of the elements he's going to use for the entire piece. One of the elements is the subject, which we hear in the soprano. This is a three-measure subject, and it starts on the tonic B, and goes down to the dominant F sharp, and then another half step, and then rises up to the C sharp, which is the second scale degree, and finally rises one more to the D, the immediate. And at this point, it spills out into a B minor arpeggio. changes a little bit on the way down to use broken inversions. 
So he's arpeggios. Bach is using both arpeggios and broken inversions in this single passage. I will refer to them as arpeggio passages. Here's the first chord, the second chord, the third, and the first. Those are your inversions. So when you learn this piece, you'll also be learning your inversions. They're a wonderful way to get around the keyboard. This is measure four now, and then the other voice, the bass. And this is interesting. This is one of the few pieces where a three-part invention only begins with two voices. So in measure four, then we hear the subject stated immediately in the bass, exactly the same, just down an octave. arpeggio passage. In fact, if we put the hands together with these two subjects to test it, we will find to C sharp, this half step has a special quality to it. it this is tight and constricted. So he's starting with his fourth. Subject begins in measure one also on the tonic for the bass and then jumps up an octave and has this tiny little motive that goes up three notes back down and to that A sharp and then do you hear how he's hovering around that tonality of B the tonic he's not moving very far away from it to the third scale degree, down to the seventh, the raised seventh step. Again, it's tight. And then when the soprano does its counter subject in measure four, an octave higher, it doesn't stop like that. Bach adds its own new arpeggio passage. And therefore, when you put those hands together in measure six, you have parallel writing of these arpeggios, all bit built on sixths and fifths. what he's doing with these arpeggio type passages. He's expanding the chordal combinations by doubling with the hands. And that's just the beginning. Where he takes this, you really will be amazed that this was written over 300 years ago. So now at the, the faster tempo, uh, because this is 916 time, in our modern day, the 16 on the bottom, we usually think of that as playing fairly evenly and accented every single 16th note. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that they have equal importance. But this is, not, as I said, not the case. These are going to move rather quickly. I like this tempo. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <laughs> nice tempo. So I'm going to put the hands together and then go on to the next part of the piece. When I play this now, what you're going to hear is the use of invertible counterpoint. When the soprano has the subject and the bass has the counter subject for the first three measures, they're going to invert and it's just the opposite then. 
the soprano then has the counter subject and the bass has the subject. And when we hear this, before I put everything together, there's one more element. When we take our downbeats, the first beats of these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, listen to the pitches we have. Measure 1, that's the two tonic Bs. Measure 2, and measure 3. a sixth. And that's part of writing good counterpoint, that the parts will invert and still sound good. So now let me play it and listen for these intervals. It has a sad quality, doesn't it? Inward. take just the alto and he's adding finally our third voice. He saves it for measure seven and from then on we have pretty much the three voices. And it is the alto that enters in measure seven and it starts off exactly like measure one that the soprano had. Until here, measure eight. To G sharp. G sharp is not in our B minor scale. And holds, holds, and repeats everything down a step. Holds, 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 and resolves. That's a sequence. This is a two measure sequence when the material plays ex exactly the same thing except down a step. Now above it, the soprano has the same sequence of the two measures. It starts on the D and holds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, and then it gets its subject fragment statement. Holds the C sharp and... So what Bach is doing is making a dialogue a voice dialogue using just the measure one of the subject, so it's a subject fragment. And they're taking turns, going back and forth, and then moving down a step. And if you put that together, this is what we have. Already sounds brighter. So our spirits have lifted ever so slightly. The bass at this point, in measure 7, is all built on the first measure counter subject fragment. Instead of... He's only taking the first part of it. But he doesn't go down that a, to the A sharp any more than the other voice did. He changes it. Breaking out, and then he takes that E down an octave and repeats it. A fourth to the A, down an octave, and down another octave. Do you hear that pattern? He's just going down this same idea, repetition of a pattern, over and over again. Now I'm going to play with my right hand the downbeat pitches. So you can hear what Bach is building on. 
Starting measure seven with the B. using as a way of modulating to a new key. He loves to do this and he does it again in the piece later on. So now I'm going to put all of these parts together uh, but there's one more step I want to do because I'm trying to also not only tell you what's going on in this piece as far as construction, but practice suggestions. And one of the practice suggestions that I highly recommend is when you have this voice dialogue all played with one hand, as you're getting to know it, what I like to do is redistribute. And I will take the soprano part with my right hand, and I will take the left hand will take the alto instead of here. I'm going to drop the down an octave for my left hand so we have a big space in between and we can more clearly hear these parts speaking to each other and which note is holding and which note is chattering away with the subject fragment. You want to be able to track these two things, the long note and the quick 16th notes. So this is a good way to practice this. Familiarize yourself with the patterns and tracking the two voices. together you can see that I really need to hang on to this D of the soprano. I can't let it go. I'm also pulling with my arm on these little 16th notes. Do you see? Everyone is pulling. Hang on to the thumb G sharp of the alto. Hang on to the C sharp of the soprano. Bach wants. He says what the objective of learning these inventions is to learn, one of the objectives is to learn how to play cleanly and well in two voices and then on to three voices and this is what he means. So not only is he making a beautiful dialogue but he's teaching how to play that so we hear the two parts speaking evenly and balanced and taking turns. There's so much of a metaphor in this writing for me of a good conversation between two people that are really respect each other and have a affection and courtesy and taking turns it's a balanced conversation and that's what he's writing here balanced it's a really it, that if you think about that you'll put a little different kind of love and care as these parts take turns back and forth all together now, we have one more passage coming up, which I can't wait to get to. And I'll show you how Bach leads into it. There's measures 7, 8, 9, and 10. That's still B minor, isn't it? But not for long. which came from measure three. And Bach, I'll show you in the bass, what he's doing is, that's the downbeat of measure 11, and he jumps up on the fourth beat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, that's F sharp he arrived on. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, that's the E, up the octave. Inversions. What he had. There's something else. 
You know what they are? They are a ladder of thirds. It's the most amazing thing. He's doing this. Repeat it down a step, because this is another sequence. You know it's coming. One more. And he arrived on D. And those bass notes would be G. is outlining the scale degrees. is one third over and all of the material uh, will repeat again in a very similar way with quite a lot of differences as well. It's just like the plot thickens in a good story but knowing these first three elements. So uh, if I were to take the right hand now of measure 11 because it doesn't do the same patterns of these arpeggio passages. These are overlapping and the groupings are different. The right hand starts on the 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Seven, eight, to give a group of one and then a double it with two and triple it with three little groups. Let me play this for you. Here's the first group. Stop. Now here are two groups. One, two, stop. Now here's the third groups. One, two, three. And the last one which it ends it. Is not part of the arpeggio passage. So these two go down the ladder of thirds. You could even put that together. <laughs> I just think that's just fabulous. It's so much fun. He's obviously delighted with this writing. And uh, there's one more part of this that I'm going to say here, even though I don't think Bach meant it. If we take the three big beats in 916 time, that's a compound meter, which really breaks down into three larger groups. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if you were conducting it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is how you would conduct a compound meter. You're not going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, that would be ridiculous. So we think of the bigger beats. Now, if I block the chords in the left hand on the bigger beats, this is what I have. are transitional passages that are moving us down the keyboard in a very creative way and playful way. Remember the light and lively that this 916 time meter meant? Well he's creating a light and lively character with all of these overlapping chords. He's clearly delighting in this. <laughs> And we 
we've arrived in the D major, like I said. Now at this point, I think it's a great time for me to show you what I'm looking at. And this is my working copy of my engraving of this piece. It's all marked up with colors and labels uh, for the lesson. You will get most of these colors and labels in another supply, which we'll get to in just a minute. But you can see that this is a big sheet of paper. It's actually 11 inches by 17 inches wide on the horizontal uh, landscape uh, format. And I take all of the notes of public domain music exactly like any other edition. I re-engrave note for note all of those notes in this new layout. It's a one of a kind because I made it up about 10 years ago. I started working on these uh, uh, publications and copywritten. So I'm able to get the, if we look here, the subject I put in red, there's a color code. The counter subject was in blue, and all the arpeggio material passages are in a green box. So we have our opening subject for soprano, and then the bass opening subject. Then here with our second system, these are systems one, two, three, four, we got the alternating voice dialogue, and you can see that the alto had the subject fragment, one measure, then answered by the soprano step down for the alto, and the soprano steps down, and the bass has its wonderful counter subject that takes us down the circle of fifths. Arriving here, this is G. So the thing is, oh, I wanted to say one more thing here, that the bass line, if you go from measure 7 all the way to measure 13, you have this fabulous bass line. Starts in G major for a little bit. Actually, let's back up to here. So your bottom structure of this composition is found on the uh, first beats of the bass of the left hand. So those, I call those anchor notes, so really pay attention to those. Your chart package now comes, your main file, comes like this in black and white. Here are the two pages of your main file. This is the entire piece. It's very restful on the eyes and gives lots of space to write. And I do have a lot of fingerings written in my editions, fingerings that work for my hands. I think fingerings are very important. And I spend a lot of time uh, working with the fingerings and writing them in and I recommend that for anybody trying to learn the piece well always use the same fingerings. After I make that two page main file where you learn your notes and your fingerings I have made a one page on the vertical portrait view the satellite view so here is your entire piece which I need to make first before I can then make my very favorite part, the color structural analysis. And I've heard from you that this is your favorite part too. And now you can see with crystal clarity, the overall construction of this piece is really very simple. Here's our subject, uh, the code here, subject in red, counter subject in blue and the 32nd note arpeggios in green. These are the key areas on the left column, the B minor tonic, the D major relative major, then we get into the subdominant here and then back eventually to our B minor again. On the right hand side are these numbers. That's how many measures in each system. So we can compare system one has six measures, three measure subject soprano, three measure subject bass. System four, six measures, again, the three measure alto subject and the three measure soprano subject. Very similar, this and this. Systems two 
and 5 are very similar. This is a little longer. These dashed phrase marks I put in to show that the pattern of sequences has two in the first time, and that the second time Bach uses the same idea, he adds one more, so we have a total of six. So he's expanding not only the length, but he's going to be vastly expanding at certainly at this point. This last green box of arpeggio passages, system six, is the culminating moment of spectacular imagination with all of these chords. And that is going to put a whole new uh, face on the piece when we get to this point. And then we have the last bracket of two systems. And amazingly, this goes off into a very deep and spiritual realm within all of the agitation and fast-moving notes. So this is a, actually, on the surface, looks like a relatively simple piece with construction, but I find it a very deep and probing piece. If you can get your uh, own chart package from my website, sallychristianmusic.com, as digital downloads, you simply take your PDFs to a print shop and have them printed on this wonderful heavy 60-pound cardstock. It'll last forever. This is your last PDF in the chart package. This is that left the green box that I said was so spectacular right over here. This happens to be measure 28. It is so difficult that I, for myself, needed a magnified view. So I took measure 28 and blew it up really big and put all of these marks on here so we can get in with a deep dive and really see how complicated and why this is so difficult to play. But I think this is gonna help. I'll just leave this up here so when we get to that point in the piece, I'll have it ready. So, are you ready to go on now to the second big the chunk of the piece, the next three systems, which are very much like the first three? So we're now in D major. I'm going to just play one more time, backing up with this measure 11, 12, and 13. One little tip on this technically I, I wanted to mention, within these pulses of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, the bigger beats that are in here, I pulse with my fingers as well and pull down a little bit more on those anchor notes, like this. with Bach. You continually learn new things. So now we are and at this point something new happens in our arpeggio note passages. If it was like measure one which stayed all in B minor
because then again in measure 17 we're in the new harmony with the subject entry for the soprano on A major and they all start on the tonic, remember? Tonic B here, this starts on the A. Have your A major arpeggio until here. So this is a new element that he's giving, a quick chordal change within the single arpeggio note-like passage. He's it's getting more complex. Then if we take the bass, it's also going to do something to accommodate those quick chordal changes. Look what he does, starting on the D. Instead of Take the right hand, I have this. that's buried in here, but it's going to be altered for the last half of it. circle of fifths would have been up 
the pattern of the counter subject, which is always three notes up and three notes down. Parts of the same configuration that we're used to. circle of fifths of a half step and inverted. When we take a passage and go one way up and down and start from the other direction, we call it inverted. So that's what he's done here, is inverted the last three. So you see that this is a lot more complicated here now with this six measure system. He's added more elements. It's longer than the first time. Still built on the circle of fifths of the bass, but altered. Let me play the whole thing now for you here, beginning of measure 20. And I'd like you to listen to how these answers and uh, trading off of the parts, almost like a question-answer in a really good three-way conversation. And the thing about it is there are multiple ways that you can play this. I could bring out my soprano loud all the way if I wanted as the dominant voice. Or I could reverse it and give the alto the dominant voice. subject motive and these are all seamlessly taking turns in going in these different harmonies these different key areas all the while moving slowly back to our tonic B minor from the E minor <laughs> the first time. Now it's going up and at the end it's breaking out of that pattern. And it, it is not straight thirds either. It starts off as thirds. And we can see these are inversions now. That would be straight inversions. That's like... And be minor, so this could be just like measure six or measure three, but it changes at the end. He goes up like this, up a fourth. That's a marvelous moment, and then everything repeats down a step, starting on C sharp now. Expand out up a fourth to F sharp, and one more repetition down a step, so this is straight B minor, until the top, which is this first inversion of G major, so again we have two different chords, back to back, quick changes, B major, that's in the first inversion of G major. That's the first inversion of E minor. So we have in groups a 
of twos, twos and twos, just like the first time had for the bass. Now the bass really has the lion's share of the expansion and unbelievable creativity that Bach is doing here. Measure 26 begins on the tonic B. I'm going to count my beats out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. Oh my gosh, did you hear that? This B minor changed three times the chord. First B minor, and then he changed to this one, which is an in, inversion, first inversion of E minor, and then he went up to here. That is two fourths in a row. to me very much like jazz. And that's why Bach is timeless. One of the many reasons that Bach is timeless will always be beloved, will always be valid, will always be needed, because this music never gets old. It's always of continual interest. Um, we, we can never know it well enough. You work on a piece like this uh, for your first pass, maybe it'll take you a year to learn. This is an advanced piece. It might take you two years to learn it. And then put it away and come back three years later, play it again, and you'll see so many new things. And you'll have that pass at it, put it away and come back. And that third time, then you really start to, to get your head around it. And that's how it is with all music. It just takes a long, long, long time to learn it learn everything. These uh, quick changing harmonies now are getting to measure 28. Playing slowly. This is what you want to do first. This is parallel writing, isn't it? pianist do a very awkward transition of bypassing hands like this. They're going to collide and bump into each other. 
if we played this on the harpsichord that Bach had, we would have the two separate manuals and this would be a piece of cake. Not an issue at all. So I'm sure this was a harpsichord piece for that reason. It's also a bright, outgoing, um, effusive piece, which would be suited for the harpsichord. But playing it on the modern day piano has a very unique challenge in this measure. So I made this a denim to show right here what's going on. This is all G major for the first uh, six beats. And then beat seven, eight, nine goes to that A sharp there. But this is the part to watch. Now, what do you see here? You see in the pink boxes five of this interval. Four, five. But it isn't played with just one hand like that. It's, see, one, two, three, four, five, all this interval of a sixth, B to G. The first three have the G's in the bass and the B's in the, in the uh, right hand, left hand, right hand. Then the last two, it switches. The group one has mirror images for beats one. from each other. But here's the sixth. three D's in the right hand and three D's in the left hand. They are the same D. This note has to be played by both hands. So that means you need to scooch inside this D or scooch to the outside depending on where you are in this passage. This is the passage that will make you think I just really shouldn't be doing this. It's too hard. I felt that way myself. So I, can I ever get this thing clean? And then I find, when I made this, I said, okay, now I know what to focus on. These sixths. And so here, see how it overlapped like that? It's weird, we don't normally play like that. This is the worst one right here. Now I'm gonna. virtuoso toccata type piece from here, th these passages coming out of our arpeggio passages in the final green box are leading in all of these expanded fourths he's reaching out this means something emotionally 
he is imploring. And I, I don't think Bach really needed to. But he was so divinely in touch with God, and he dedicated all of his music to God. And he also had a profound compassion for the human condition. And I think he's addressing that here, the struggles of humankind and the quick and rapid emotional changes when we're buffeted about by challenges in life. That's all in here <clears throat> with these quick moving harmonic changes. You see, it all it is it hitting at, at, at something else of a message. The music is always giving a message and it's a comfort for us to have it expressed in this form of such great beauty. We intuitively know we resonate with it. We may not even know why. But I'm going to now ask you to listen carefully to these harmonies coming up of where Bach is, is going with all of this. Let's do these passages one more time, slowly. <laughs> in a piece like this to go off onto this tangent at this point with this these fermatas and he has a fermata at the end too over both the treble and the bass clef so he has double fermatas in this piece <sighs> play that slowly to really hear those. When you play it up to tempo, still know that they're in there. Oh, and this bass goes. And the last time we have the counter subject is, uh, uh, let me play it straight through and I'll show you where we come. Let's take a look at this CSA here. Because here we are now with the last bracket here with just the two systems which are so different. This is all repetition. This, this, the big blocks is the bulk of the piece and it's just percolating along in a predictable and understandable way and then all of a sudden here everything changes. 
So I'm, I'm really still in a serious inquiry about what all of this means. But if I let the harmonies guide me, how do they make me feel? That's a great big part of then how I'm going to play it. What is that character here? And this is not a, a very um, optimistic mood at this point. Whereas over here in this D major, it's percolating along and bubbling along just very easily and uh, relaxed and enjoying life. So there's a lot in this piece. I think that's what this is. As I'm speaking now, that this is a kind of an overview of life, of everything that we come across in a condensed one and then twenty, one minute, twenty second, one almost a one and a half minute piece. So we have our final wrap up, the subject fragment, subject fragment, subject fragment, but these are all altered, new intervals expanded out. Two last arpeggios, B minor, G major, and then one last soprano subject fragment. And finally, he ends with the counter subject as a trio of voices. How do you, why, why, why did he do that? That's what I mean. This is so unconventional. And I labeled this as a coda here at the end because it does wrap up the three elements the subject, the counter subject, and the arpeggio passages we found all within the first three measures. He comes back to those again, the arpeggio passages, the subject, and the counter subject to wrap it all up right here. But this one right here, there's a whole lot of power in that point in the piece. <laughs> and he uses that two octaves apart on a single tonic many, many times in these um, inventions. It's this simple. This comes back to the most simple, basic, single pitch of the tonic. So I do th hear this piece as, uh, I feel, I feel like this piece is an offering um, going two ways. Um, as, as everything does in life, what we give out comes back. And, and what we search for, too, our thoughts are so important. Keeping good thoughts about yourself, um, positive self-talk is something um, 
that is so important, especially when we are playing music like this and we want it to be right and we want it to be perfect. And it takes so long sometimes and we think we're never going to get there and you, we feel frustrated with ourselves. I'm making this all up right now, but I'm feeling compelled to talk about it because your work will have a whole different quality to it when you are nice to yourself. And just take it at whatever pace you need to take it. Just take hands alone, take it really slowly and just build it up in logical steps, little by little by little. Um, that's one of the reasons I love these charts so much because I will many times play these systems out of context and I will work just on the two green boxes at one session. Or I'll work on uh, this one and, and that one. And then especially this last part, I'm going to work a lot on that out of context. So it's not so overwhelming then when you do spot work and work in specific sections on a piece and then go and play the, same, the piece all the way through. And whatever didn't work, guess what? Go back and play that part again that didn't work. And that's what I do. When I, when I go down at the practice room, where I am right now, I ask myself with any given piece, which is the part I really need to work on the most? And I always know what it is. And I'll start my session with that. And then I'll play the whole thing. And then I'll go back to that piece part again. So I've gotten that three times instead of just once. You'll be amazed how that works. The last tip that's really important is because they've done studies on this. You need to give your brain a six hour rest between learning something. So try, try to get two practice sessions in if you can, one in the morning and then give the brain a six hour rest and then come back for an evening session. And then you're gonna get twice the results. The information seats that way up here. It's, they've done studies on it. It's, it's really amazing. So if you're crunch time and you have to play a recital or you know, a competition and you've gotta get it learned quickly for your deadline, uh, do that. Two practice sessions a day works great. And, and memorize as you learn, hands alone, and just have a, have a wonderful time with this um, process. Uh, there's my uh, closing quote here is by a man named Will Durant, and it's about excellence. And he says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So make your good practice habits and do them every day, correctly and mindfully, and you will have excellence. Thank you so much. I hope you, this has been helpful for you. And please do learn your Sinfonia 15.